I grew up in an era where if you were a geek, you were pretty much alone in that fact in your high school, maybe two or three others, mm -hmm. and the quarterback would slam you into the lockers and give you a wedgie. Yeah. All right. We now live in a time where the quarterback knows that it's the geek who fixes his computer. Right. A. B. Geeks can find one another outside of their own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Social media allows that. It is my read of the way of things that that's why things such as Comic-Con now attracts hundreds of thousands of people. It's the mo most diverse collection of people I have ever seen. That's cool. In America. Okay? And they're, they're cosplaying, they're... They love Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, Xena, the Warrior Princess, comics. They have their common denominator. Mm -hmm. But what is also true about them is that they have a deeply, a deeply felt level of science literacy. They know the difference between fantasy and reality, even though their social lives thrive in the fa the world of fantasy. When they exit that room, they know the difference. Now, the word geek is no longer an insult. It's a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. The Geek Squad is the name of, of uh, Best, Buy. Best Buy's folks. Yeah. Geek is now a marketing term on web pages. Right. Think Geek is a, is a fun product space where that serves the interests of the geek world. Also, you get people, typically pundits, who are not scientifically literate, saying things that e express deep science illiteracy, and you have a community of people responding to them. So There was a day when they, they would go unrebutted. Oh. But now they don't. Now they don't. Who's the rebuttal? Everybody. Great. Everybody. Blogs. Rise up. Look what this guy said on the evening news then. He has no clue that this is what's actually true. Mm -hmm. Let's call him out on it. And so when you have this restoring force for a, the truth of objective realities, these are the kinds of things that can restore a nation to the innovation culture that I think we once at one time took for granted. As, as, our, as science becomes cool again in the United States and in Western Europe, um, is... And I have a partner in crime. Oh. A... Uh, uh, Brian Cox, mm -hmm. who, if you ask anyone from the UK, they fully know who he is. Mm -hmm. He's a physicist turned popularizer, and he's still a good physicist, turned popularizer of science. And he hosts documentaries and all the like. So we are sort of cultural counterparts. Mm -hmm. And he has the following of a rock star, and he's a physicist in the UK. As we think about where science can take us, can brands and companies be a part of that? I mean, I am, after all, working for a marketing firm. I mean, or is it just really, does it have to be a national enterprise if it's going to work? Oh, uh, great question. My read of history tells me that the first big expensive f first steps that are, that are taken, in space, for example, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. To do something that no one has done before, mm -hmm. typically there's not a return on that. So governments have to do it. Right. Once the governments do it, and they decide where the trade winds are, and where the hostels are, and where the friendlies are, then you can offload that to commercial enterprise. That could do it more cheaply and more efficiently. Once you've established a capital markets valuation of that activity, then by all means, cede it to private enterprise. In which case, marketing becomes an element. There's, of course, some marketing that goes on when a nation undergoes a, an activity. Mm -hmm. The pact that Life magazine had with the original Mercury 7 astronauts was, in its own way, a marketing ploy, right. if you will. Mm -hmm. It enabled the general public to meet the, the astronauts in ways they would not have otherwise been able to do so, and embrace their activities and give them the props for the heroism that their efforts uh, required. So I th so there's always marketing and everything, but in terms of the purest sense of marketing and advertising, that's clearly the next wave of what goes on after you breach any frontier at all. And I look forward to that. Um, you're a gifted storyteller and a gifted scientist at the same time. Uh, it strikes me that that's a rare combination. But maybe it's not. Are we not hearing a bunch of wonderful stories because of our 
bias towards towards narrative or our, 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 our mistrust of science? My hope mm -hmm. is that my visibility mm -hmm. will sort of rub off on academic departments across the land mm -hmm. so that when any of their faculty decides that they're going to show up on a talk show or write a book, that that activity will be embraced or as a minimum not be held against them. I think when that happens, you will see an entire wave of scientists who are socialized, who can tell a good story, might even have a sense of humor. These are talents or abilities for which no rewards await us in my field. Mm -hmm. And so there is no reason for anybody to cultivate it, even if they did have the capacity to do it well. So my hope is that'll rise up and I can just go, go to the Bahamas and say, <laughs> I'm done. I, yeah, I'm done. I don't need to, if, if it's only me, then that's like cult building. And I don't, right. Then I would have failed. Right. As an educator, I would have failed. If it has to be me, then I failed. You, you spoke of yourself as an educator. Is that what you think of yourself primarily? No, I'm a scientist and educator. Okay. I, I'm a scientist in my heart and in my mind. In practice, I do a lot of things that bring science to the public. So, I find myself out of accuracy counting myself among the ranks of educators. Mm -hmm. However, true educators think way more about education than I do. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to I, I don't want to put myself in their camp undeservedly. Right. I look at a camera lens, they look at actual faces that they're trying to teach. They're in the trenches, I'm not, and I'm, I will never forget that. So, if they allow me every now and then to count myself among their ranks, I'm grateful to them for that permission. Uh, but I'm fundamentally a scientist. One of the things that's been on everybody's lips around here has been sustainability. Um, and I know that science and exploration has a huge amount to do with sustainability. Are you optimistic about our future? I have some unorthodox views regarding sustainability. Okay. Sustainability is what you say and the way you think when you're confronted with limited resources. Okay. Okay. However, the history of limited resources in our civilization <coughs> is one where a whole new solution arises that renders the limitations of the resources irrelevant. So that's a very optimistic viewpoint. Yes. But it's real. Yes. It's, it's, it's optimistic informed by actual right. conduct. So, for example, salt used to be a strategic limited resources, controlled by governments. It was the only way we knew to allow your autumn crop to be preserved through the winter so that you would survive and not starve to death. Wars were fought over salt. Mm -hmm. Access to salt was everything. Mm -hmm. And then we, we discovered canning, and we discovered refrigeration, and freezing, and, and then salt became this side thing. There are no wars fought over salt anymore. The strategic value of that commodity was rendered obsolete in the face of other discoveries that allowed you to accomplish the very same thing. The creativity of the engineer can render a prior problem simply obsolete without actually solving the problem. Think about it. You solve the problem by coming up with a completely different solution that is not a natural extension of the efforts to solve the problem you've been scratching your head over. Like the problem of flies in the streets of New York a century ago. Uh -huh. High population density, horses everywhere, manure in the streets, flies. How do you solve that? Well, do you change the feed stocks of the horses so that they, they have less manure or that it's less attractive to flies? Well, what do you do? Uh, so a car gets invented. Oh, there you go. They're fixed. Cars don't have manure coming out the other. they got other things yeah. that we would later learn that is, has its own problem, right. but it's not manure. Right. And the fly problem is solved essentially overnight, not by solving the manure problem. So when you say sustainability, yeah. That presupposes a limitation to our resources, but I, as an astrophysicist, know 
the limitless resources that are floating around in space, some of which, if we didn't deflect it, would hit us and render us extinct. Right. So why not go out there and mine some asteroids for a change, instead of running away from an asteroid that might render us extinct? Then all this talk about sustainability, and, and, and sunlight, is essentially limitless. We're fighting wars over who's on top of some oil under the sands, that oil laid millions of years ago by fossils that are not replaceable, and you want to conserve this? There's no shortage of energy in the universe. You don't have to conserve energy. Figure out a way to tap it. Then you're not even having a conversation about the oil. That's not even an interesting conversation. Because energy is boundless coming from other places, and you've created another invention that can exploit it. And maybe we don't find a way to get other energy, but someone finds a way to scrub the atmosphere of CO2 and make CO2 bricks that we then bury. That's, a, that's an interesting solution. You still burn the fossil fuels, but now there's no carbon footprint because of it. You're buried in the soil. So what, what are the cliffs of Dover? But stored carbon. Carbon, right. That's what they are. It's stored carbon. Right? That's not in our atmosphere. Nothing wrong with burying carbon. Carbon is, doesn't care. The earth is happy. The conservationists are good. So I try, as a scientist, and I think the community of innovators needs to keep the option open that somebody can invent something that does not derive from what it is you're already, that from the solutions you're already thinking. Design thinking, what in other words. Uh, sure, if that's the phrase for it. If that's you guys have a phrase. I, well, that's the phrase, you know, reframing the problem as much as, re as thinking of a solution. Correct. And I would go so far as to say, let everyone explore wherever there's unknown, and after the fact, see what connects. Hmm. Because if I require that you solve the problem, you're not even going to know to stand over there to solve the problem. Because you're going to always think in a derivative way. I'll give you yet another example, and I'm talking too long here. It's okay, we're loving it. If I give you a billion dollars, yeah. a limitless money, and I say, here's the Franklin stove. I want you to improve on it. And you happen to be an expert in thermodynamics. You'll make a more efficient stove. You might invent a pilot light. Mm -hmm. You'll find a way to put a thermocoupler in there so that you can control temperature, maybe link the temperature to how long the oven is on. You can electronify the controls. That's what you'll do. But you would have never invented a microwave oven. Right. Because it does not derive from that expertise. You wouldn't even know where to stand to invent a microwave oven. Who invents the microwave oven? The people who are communications experts, who specialize in microwave communications between submarines, between ground and airplanes. It's the engineer there that makes this connection. So the way to do this is you have everybody think how they want, then bring them together in the coffee lounge. Cross-pollinate there. There's your truly innovative solutions to problems you may have thought were intractable. So you asked the simple question, what do I think of uh, sustainability? Um, the universe is at our disposal. And the universe never asks to be sustained. <laughs> it doesn't need to be. Because it's essentially infinite.